The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to try him. My God will never fail. My God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh. 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 There's power. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he wins. And a giant, because I know how this story ends. Yeah, I know how this story ends. Hey, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle.
your victory. I'm gonna see your victory for the battle. Oh, it belongs to the Lord. I'm gonna see your victory. I'm gonna see your victory for the battle. It belongs to the Lord. Oh. Well, this morning, uh, I want to continue what we started talking about last week, about the power of hope. And, uh, you know, last week we said hope was, if we could give a simple definition to hope, hope is the anticipation of good. In other words, hope anticipates that something good is around the corner. Something good is about to happen for me, where fear is the anticipation of bad. Or many times we call that a foreboding spirit. In other words, we are waiting for the shoe to drop, as some people would say. So something bad to come or something negative would come. Even if, even if things are, were good right now, something negative might come. That's called a foreboding spirit or a fear. Really, it's a manifestation of fear where hope is the anticipation of good, right? You could hope in the midst of any situation, and I was thinking about it, I was actually journaling about this this morning, where it seems like no matter what happens, when hope is in your heart, you believe that God's going to do something good out of it. You know, even maybe, maybe some of you who are watching, your life has changed a lot during this. Others of you, you know, maybe you're still going to work and nothing's changed in that sense. Maybe you just don't have a haircut yet or something like that. But for others of you, maybe things have changed a lot. But even in the midst of that, you have to remember, if things have changed a lot or seem to have been negative, remember, when there's hope in your heart, then you just simply believe that God is even using this to set you up for the good things and for the great things that he has around the corner. Here's what I believe. I believe that when God's put a promise in your heart, when God's put his word in your heart, when there's hope in you, that no matter what happens, even when negative things come my way, and listen, we all go through them, right? We all go through what seems like setbacks. When setbacks come my way, I was, you know, I always remind myself, well, the Lord is using this to set me up to go forward. See, what the enemy intends for evil, the Lord always turns around for the good, God's going to take the advantage of it. And, and you know, you know they, people used to say, you know, something could either be your tombstone or it could be your stepping stone, right, to the next thing that God has for you. So if I, could, if I was to ask you this morning, as you're watching online, and I was to ask you, what is it that you see? Now, I'm not talking about what is it that you see on your screen right now, but I'm talking about if you were to close your eyes and to look within your heart, what do you see? What do you see? What's the image that you see for tomorrow? What's the image that you see within you for the future? Because what you see on the inside of you is the barometer of the hope that you have in you. The pictures that we see on the inside speaks of the hope or fear or the level of hope that's on the inside of us. See, when hope dies, or let me say it this way, when hope is challenged or hope is choked out on the inside of us, we lose vision for the good that is in our future. Now, we know that God says that he has good in our future. Jeremiah 29 says, God says, I know the plans I have for you. It's for your good. It's for, you know, I think the King James says, it's for your welfare. Not to put you on welfare, but it's for your welfare, right? God has good plans for you. So that is the hope that's in us. That's the hope that the word puts in us. But when that hope begins to be choked out and, or begins to be overwhelmed by the fear that we allow in our heart, then the vision, the hope, the good things that we see on the inside of us begins to fade away, begins to die on the inside of us. Now I, want you, I want us to look at this verse. It's going to be kind of our main verse for this morning, even though we're going to look at a lot of verses today. is Romans 15, verse 13. Romans 15, 13. 
The Apostle Paul says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy. Now I'm going to ask those helping us with our online just to keep that verse up a little bit longer this morning. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you, as you're looking at that verse right now, whether it's on the screen or in your Bible, I want you to notice certain words. You might, if it's in your Bible, you might want to underline them or circle them. I want you to look at the word now. It says, now may the God of hope. Realize God has hope for you in the now. Hope is always in the now. It's not someday God will give you hope. Hope is always in the now. Right now, no matter what the world might be going through or, or precisely what you might be going through, no matter what might be happening in your life, the God of hope is giving you hope right now. It says, now, there's a, uh, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy. Joy is another word. What is, what, does, what is the result of hope in your life? The result of hope in your life is joy. Joy comes into your life when you have hope. Actually, scientists have told us that, you know, chemicals are released in our body when we have joy. Chemicals that heal us are released in our body when we have joy. No wonder Nehemiah says that the joy of the Lord is our strength, right? Even your body gets stronger, even though you've been really eating those Twinkies during this, you know, six weeks and, you know, that comfort food. See, our house has been nachos. I mean, I can't, I don't even know how many bags of nachos or, and chips and salsa we've gone through. It's just, that's kind of like, uh, it's, it's coronavirus food, isn't it? Corona, I, I didn't say beer, I said coronavirus, because some of you kind of went there in your mind, chips, salsa, corona. Okay, so, um, it's more fun when you're here, so you could all laugh. All right, so, is. uh, So he says, you know, so chemicals are released in your body to even bring strength to you when you have joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy, and watch this, and peace. So hope brings joy, it brings peace while you're, and and causes faith to come. It says, in believing that you may abound in hope. You know what the word abound means? It's to have plenty of, to have a lot of, to abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of God is released in our life to fulfill the visions that God puts on the inside of us when we hold on to hope in our lives. So hope is the anticipation of good, where on the other hand, the devil is the uh, giver of the anticipation of bad, right? He, he tries to put fear on the inside of us. Fear is basically faith in, in, in reverse. Uh, fear will cause you to, uh, to abound in hopelessness, where hope will uh, cause you to abound in hope and faith. Fear will uh, cause you to abound in hopelessness. Now, if you have your notes, now if you, again, if you're on Facebook, you could go to our online campus, and we have our notes on our online campus. You could download them. You could follow along there. But, you know, what is hope? Point number one, hope is this. Hope is a positive picture in your mind about the future. That's, I, I, we're going to make this very practical this morning. What is hope? is a positive picture in your mind about the future, and it's put in there by the Holy Spirit. One of the things i found, and you've You've heard me say this many times. People will ask me, well, how do you get vision? How do you get, you know, how do you know where you're going to go in the future? How do you know, you know, decisions you're going to make for the church in the future? You know, I don't really sit there and ask God to give that to me. I just spend time with God. I just make it a daily habit to uh, begin my day spending time with God. And it's, it's like when I'm praying, when I'm worshiping, when I'm praising, I just run into hope. I just run into vision. I just run into the things that God has in the future. I've never had a uh, vision planning, uh, you know, retreat I've ever done. I'm not saying that's bad. It's just every morning is my retreat into his presence. And I run into the vision that he has in in my heart. Now, people, you know, have said to me often, man, you're a visionary. There's always something you're planning for the future. It's not because it's just something in me. Listen, growing up, I wasn't like that. I was just kind of like, just go along, never thought about anything new. But it's when you spend time with the Holy Spirit, he brings pictures into your mind. You know, and it's always pictures of hope and vision. If you're getting pictures of uh, dread and Bad things are going to happen. Listen, I'm telling you, that is not the Holy Spirit. 
The devil tries to put those pictures on the inside of you. See, just as God puts pictures on the inside of us so that he could bring to pass the good future he has for us, the devil tries to put negative pictures on the inside of us if if we let him. Because when he puts those on the inside of us, then we cooperate with him to bring those to pass in our life. You say, well, how do I know it's the devil? Well, if it's negative, it's for destruction. If it's for steal, kill, and destroy, it's the devil. And stop negotiating with him. Stop talking to him. You know, it's funny. Over the years, I used to you know, hear people say, well, the devil told me this. The devil told me that. Well, shut up. Stop hanging out with him and listening to him. Just tell him to shut up. You don't have to hang out with him. It's kind of like if people who are, like, really negative, you don't have to hang out with them. Why do you have to hang out with the devil too, right? Don't hang out because he's puts those negative pictures on the inside of you i know throughout my life everything that god has accomplished and by the way let me just say this he's always accomplished more than i've ever thought but things that god has accomplished in my life it has always started with a dream on the inside of me now how is it that i could have a dream on the inside of me it's because i have hope on the inside of me that god has a good plan that god has a future that that his promises in you create hope and faith in your life Proverbs 29, 18, a very familiar portion of scripture for us, says this, where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint, where there's no revelation. I like how the ESV says it, Proverbs 29, 18 in the ESV says, where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. What, what does that mean? That means when we're not hearing the voice of God, when prophetically God is not showing us pictures and putting vision on the inside of us, notice what it says, that people cast off restraint. That means there's no discipline. There's no direction. There's rebellion in our life when there is no vision on the inside of us. Listen, if you're rebelling against God, it's because you've lost hope and there's no vision on the inside of you. When there's hope in us, For what God has said, listen, there's no rebellion. There's no undisciplined. There's any of that. We're going towards the vision and the goal that God's put on the inside of us. The message translation says it like this. If people can't see what God is doing. Isn't that good? When people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. And they, uh, but when we, when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed when people can't see what God is doing. If you remember last week, I gave you the pathway to hope and you know, through the life of Jesus. And I said one of those principles was Jesus would look at what the Father was doing. He says, I only do the things that I see the Father doing. You might want to ask the Lord right now. Maybe not while I'm preaching, if that keeps you from listening. But anyway, but, but maybe when this is over or maybe a little bit later or maybe even right now, if you can, is just ask the Lord, say, God, what are you doing right now? Lord, in the midst of what's happening in the world, what are you doing right now? Lord, in the midst of all these changes that have happened in our family the last few weeks, God, what are you doing right now? And listen, when you do that, I'll guarantee you, God says, I'm not doing anything. God's not going to tell you he's in quarantine and he can't, like, do anything. God's always doing something. He's, he's working on your behalf. God's, see, and listen, you don't have to try to get a vision. If you just get his vision, you're going to be blessed because what God is doing is already has the blessing on it. So many of us ask, God, bless this plan, bless this vision. No, just get his vision. It's already blessed. You don't have to ask for the blessing. So hope is uh, a, a picture on the inside of us. It, it begins to release uh, the, the power of God on the inside of us to accomplish what he's called us to do. Point number two on your notes, hope releases God's power into your life. Hope releases God's power into your life. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Notice what Paul says. He says, you know, he does beyond what we ask, right? We know that. We pray, and God does even beyond that, right? Isn't he so good? But watch what he also says. He says, beyond what you ask or think. Did you know your thinking is as loud as your praying? It is. You know, we, we tend to think sometimes, well, if I don't say it out loud, then God doesn't know. He knows. He knows our thoughts. 
And I believe the scripture teaches that our thoughts are as just as loud as our words. So in other words, I could be going before the Lord and praying one thing, but if my thoughts are going in the opposite direction, they're canceling, they're canceling what I just prayed. So my prayers and my thoughts have to come together. So when I pray something, my thinking has to be aligned with that because, because not only do my words go up before the Lord in prayer, but my thoughts go up before the Lord in prayer. It says, now he's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that I could ask or think. But watch this, according to the power that works in us. And we already saw that. What is the power that works in us? It's the Holy Spirit that's released. That power is released because of hope that's on the inside of us. Beyond we could ask or think. See, the God of hope is the one who puts the picture on the inside of you. See, you have to understand this principle. If you could catch this principle, your life will change. Is this. Everything in life gets accomplished twice. First in the visible, uh, then in the invisible. Or we could say the invisible and the visible. In other words, if I could break through in the spirit... That comes into my natural. So if, if I could see it in the Holy Spirit, then I could believe it and bring it into this natural realm. So in other words, things on the inside of you don't change because something on the outside of you changed. Things on the outside of you change because something broke through on the inside. See, your inner breakthrough becomes your outer breakthrough. Your inner reality becomes your outer reality. You know, people think, well, if I won the lottery, if I got a lot of money, man, I would sure feel better about things on the inside. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot of people who are really rich who are really miserable on the inside. But listen, when your soul prospers, then you prosper. That's why 3 John says, beloved, I pray above all things that you may prosper and be in health. What? As your soul prospers. Your soul cannot prosper without hope on the inside. Right? Hope is the anticipation of good. Hope is that picture of the good that God is doing on the inside of us. Ephesians 3.20 out of the Amplified says this, Now to him who by, who by in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us, he is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly far over and above all that we dare. Come on, I dare you to ask. Or to think indefinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, and dreams. Come on. Listen, how many would agree with me that your life is far above what you could have ever dreamed of? It is. Listen, I've been, I've been walking with the Lord since I was 16. And, and I, won't go, I won't bore you with my life story because it will never be a movie. But, uh, you know, but really when I thought about my future, what I thought that could happen to God would do, God has already in my life done super abundantly above what I ever thought where my life would be. And listen, I'm still really young. I got like over half my life still left, and I'm excited to see what God is going to do. Come on, I, you better say amen online right there. And I said I was still young. Okay, so, so God does super abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. See, if you have no dream or no hope on the inside of you, then your faith never goes beyond that because Hebrews 11, 11, 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So, and you know, what is a substance? Substance is something you could touch. It has, re, you know, uh, material reality to it. So faith gives material reality to the things you have hoped for. So in other words, faith takes things that are in the spirit realm and it brings it into the natural realm. That's why I said things happen twice. They happen first in the invisible, then in the visible. So hope works in the invisible, and then faith gives substance to it. It brings it into the natural. So if I lack hope, if I allow hope to be robbed from inside my heart, remember, hope also brings peace and joy. So, I, so I'm losing peace, I'm losing joy when I lose hope. But when I hold on to hope, I'm actually bringing, uh, faith then allows that thing to become real and become reality in my life. So hope get, brings that into our lives. Hope also gives us power to see. We're able to see what God is doing. We're able to see 
good, the goodness of God. We're able to see even the future of what God has for us when there's hope on the inside of us. How many remember a man by the name of, name of Nicodemus who, in John chapter 3, you know, he's, he, he was uh, one of the rulers of the synagogue and you know, he was uh, respected in the religious realm. And because Jesus was kind of a rebel at that time, you know, he sneaks to him at night because he was hungry. He knew that Jesus was speaking truth. And, and he asked him this question. He says to him, uh, Master, what must I do to be born again? And Jesus begins to talk to him about being born again. And, and here's what Jesus said in John 3, 3. He says, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God. How I many know the kingdom of God is not just a theory somewhere out there? You could actually see the kingdom. You could see the results of the kingdom. And part of that is you see the, the, what hope brings into your life the goodness, the power, the super abundant above all that you could dream that God brings into your life. So hope allows you to see. So, point number three on your notes is this God opens our eyes. Two, and I'm going to get, tell you what, when God opens your eyes, why does, he do, why does he do it? What is he trying to accomplish in your life when he opens your eyes? Number one is this. When God opens your eyes is to solve problems in your life. Did you know when there's hope in our heart? Then our eyes able to see, and when our eyes able to see, we're able to solve problems in our life. How many would just love to solve any problem that comes your way? Because God gives you supernatural insight in how to do that. It, op it opens your eyes to uh, solve problems. In Genesis 21, you know, we have the story of, you know, Abraham and Sarah, of course. God's given them a promise that they're going to have a child. And then Sarah decides to, you know, encourage her husband to, you know, go have a child with her servant, Hagar. How many know that's like a soap opera reality show right there, right? You see that going bad. Come on. Come on. Click the heart button on there. How many do you see this going bad? That's a bad idea when your wife says, hey, why don't you go, whatever, with my servant, Hagar. Now, guys, if your wife ever told you that, do not be so stupid. It is a trick question. And Abraham says, all right, if you say so. And he goes, whatever. Whatever because there's kids watching. And they have a child called, remember his name? Ishmael. Ishmael. Now, of course, we know historically that the, 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 the Jews are the descendants of Isaac and the um, Arabs are the descendants of Ishmael. Now, do you see the conflict? Even to this day, there's problems in that house, right? So, <laughs> so, uh, Abraham and uh, Hagar have this son named Ishmael. And then, remember, it was Sarah who encouraged him to do that. Then she's like, I hate her and I hate that kid. They're leaving here. I'm telling you, that was a dumb thing Abraham did. He might be the father of our faith, but yeah, it was dumb. Anyway, and uh, she says, I want them out of here. Sent them away. And, you know, and Abraham did. He had to, you know, he loaded them up with some stuff. He sent them away and... You know, now they were out of food, they were out of water, and now it says the child was crying, there was hopelessness on the inside of him. And watch what happens in Genesis chapter 21, verse 19. It says, then God opened her eyes. God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled it, uh, filled the skin and, with water, and gave the lad a drink. Notice, she saw a well. Did you know God did not create that well? The well was already there. But she couldn't see it because of hopelessness in her life. When we lack hope in our life, we're blind to the solutions around us. We're blind to the miracles that God has already set up for us the provisions that he's already set up for us. We don't see them because of hopelessness. Have you, have you ever met people that are really hopeless? They're always talking about what doors are closed and what's not working and how this isn't going to happen, that's not going to happen, nothing's working out for them. But, but the whole time God has provision for them all around them, but they just can't see it because of their state of mind. And it says, and God opened her eyes and she saw the well 
that was there that God had provided for her to be sustained. See, you will see things that you couldn't see before when there's hope on the inside of you. See, last week I told you, you know, Zechariah 10.9, and, you know, I've been sharing about that forever, haven't I? For, for months and months and months, not knowing where we are today, where it says, in the time of the latter rain, ask for rain. Because there, there's a rain of blessing that's always coming on, the ins- on us. And I told you last week, I said, you know, when Jesus died on the cross and when he rose to heaven, he opened up the heavens and now there's blessings of hope, constant, the blessings of, uh, you know, hope and goodness and provision. You know, they're raining on us. And, you know, in the days of the latter rain, he, he says, ask for rain. But what happens is when there's disappointment, when there's a lack of hope, we don't allow the rain of his blessings to come upon us. Some of you maybe have seen me do this before, but... You know, some of us are carrying around an umbrella of disappointment. You know, we carry around an umbrella of hopelessness, an umbrella of disappointment, and God could be raining blessing all around us, but it's not getting on us because we're carrying disappointment and hopelessness in our heart. And we could be looking around everyone who's getting blessed and people who are seeing God's provision and people are excited about the future. They don't care about the corona. They're excited about the future because they know God has something good around the corner. And then we're looking around saying, what are they all excited about? I'm miserable. You all should be miserable with me. Have you noticed that? People are miserable. They want you to be miserable with them. I won't go any further than that. Okay. Especially right now, you could see that, can't you? But they're looking around and saying, why is everybody blessed? Why are everybody excited? But how come it's not? Because they're carrying in their hand a, a, an umbrella of disappointment and hopelessness that's keeping from blessing to come into their life. I mean, God's trying to get good things to you. You just got to let him. You just got to get rid of the disappointment and the hopelessness and all those things that we, that, we, that we go around and just put over our lives. And we just allow it to, you know, keep what God's trying to bring into our life. Here's the second thing. That God wants to open your eyes to. He, want, he when He opens our He opens our eyes to see the future, right? He opens your eyes to see the future. You know, Jesus told Peter one day, and listen, Peter, you know, till the very end. I mean, till the crucifixion and ascent, you know, resurrection of Jesus, he was still messing up. He wasn't like, you know, he would not have been voted in his class as the most likely to succeed, right? I mean, he was the one like, I mean, just messing up all the time. I mean, he's like, Jesus, bid me to come if it's you. Come. I'm sinking now. You know, when he tried to cut off the guy's head when they came to arrest Jesus, he couldn't even get that done right. He just cut off an ear. I mean, he was not going to be voted most likely to succeed. But here's what Jesus says to him. Jesus says, Peter, because, you know, the, the, his name was Simon. Simon means reed, flake. Flaky, you know, but the wind, he's just kind of moving. He says, Simon, your name's going to be Peter. In other words, the Peter means rock. He says, you're going to be a rock. And he says, and I will build my church on the revelation that you just got of who I was. How you know right now, you, you might be looking at your life saying, man, I've just been inconsistent. I've been, you know, like weak. I've just been not full of faith. You might be kind of like a Simon, a reed. But you know, when we get hope on the inside of you, when you get the word of God on the inside of you, you become like a Peter. You become a rock, right? You become, you know, the, that, that person who's stable and steady, who's able to see God do amazing things in their life. You know, when God appeared to Gideon, who was hiding in the wine press, he doesn't show up and says, you scaredy cat, you wimp, you weakling. What does he say? You mighty man of valor. You're about to do great things. And maybe you're not in a wine press. Maybe you're hiding in the home right now with your mask on and gloves inside your house. And you might be like, I'm fearful right now. I'm scared. But God, God, I mean, God never says, well, you have every right to be scared right now. There's a virus going around. No, God's going to say to you, you are a mighty man of valor, mighty woman of valor. Do not fear. I have a great hope and a future for you. Isaiah 60 verse 4 says, lift up your eyes all around and see. Lift your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons come from afar and your daughters 
I shall be nursed by your side. But he's telling Israel, he says, lift up your eyes and see. See, the problem is we let our negative emotions overwhelm our vision and hope, and we begin to imagine the worst. So God is telling Israel, he says, lift up your eyes and see. In the very next verse, he says, then you shall see and become radiant. Then you shall see and become radiant. When were, they going to become, uh, when were they going to be able to see and become radiant? When they lifted up their eyes to see. What does it mean to lift up your eyes to see? It just simply means on the inside of you saying, listen, I'm not going to let uh, fear, I'm not going to allow hopelessness to, uh, to try to take a hold of my heart. I'm going to lift up my spiritual eyes and I'm going to look to the Lord, see what he's doing, and I'm going to see. Here's a third thing that happens when God opens your eyes. You begin to see who he really is. You begin to see who God really is. You know, one of my favorite stories, and I know I say that about all of them, but one of my favorite stories is about the disciples on the road to Emmaus. In Luke 24, verse 16, it says, you know, they were walking and they were talking about what had happened with Jesus. He had just been crucified. And then Jesus, in his resurrected form, comes and begins to walk with them. It says in verse uh, 16 of chapter 24 of Luke, it says, but their eyes were restrained. Did you see that? But their eyes were restrained. They couldn't see. So that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? I think we, we miss something in a passage sometimes when we just read it. It says, their eyes were restrained. And Jesus says, what kind of conversation is that that you're having and you're sad? Did you know your eyes, your spiritual eyes, are going to be restrained in life depending upon your conversations and your mood? When you have negative conversations that bring fear or bring sadness in your life, your eyes actually begin to be restrained and you don't see what Jesus is doing in front of you. You don't see the very things that God is trying to do in your life because your eyes are restrained because of your conversation. And because you, you, then you allow the fear or the sadness to come into your life. Then verse 25, it says, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expanded to them all the scriptures uh, concerning the things of himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for, uh, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and he gave it to them. Verse 31, I love this. Says, then their eyes were, what, opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight, I love verse 32. And they said to one another, did our heart burn, did our heart not burn within us as he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us, it says, and they knew him. They knew him. Notice once their conversation changed and they started hearing the word, their eyes opened and they knew him. The word knew him is to, to know intimately. They had a revelation See, if you're not seeing what God is doing right now, maybe you need to change your conversation and start putting a word on the inside of you because then your eyes will open and you will see exactly what God is doing. I could hear the amens out there, so thank you. All right. Number four, he opens our eyes so that we could see who we are. See, number three was to see who he is, but to, then to see who we are. By the way, you'll never see who you are until you see who he is. You know, in um, the children of Israel in, in Numbers 13, 33, is, you know, when, they were, when they saw giants in the land, here's what they said. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, uh, who came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers, watch this, in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Notice, where were they grasshoppers at? First in their sight. They first had a grasshopper mentality in their sight. And then they projected it on them. How you see yourself determines how the devil sees you. 
How you see yourself determines how others see you. Begin to see yourself as God intended for you. You are a mighty man or a woman of valor. You are the healed one. You are the victorious one. You are the provided for one. You are the one full of joy, full of strength. You're the one who's the head and not the tail. You're the one blessed going in and blessed coming out. Listen, everybody else might be bored and freaking out with the coronavirus, but you're getting stronger day by day, and you're going to change the world once you get out of the confinement that that you're in. Listen, even right now, you could change the world. You could change the world with the sphere of people around you and the influences you have online and things like that. Listen, God is doing mighty things on the inside of you. He says, lift up your eyes and see. What, let, let me go back to the very first question I started with. What do you see? What do you see in your future? What do you see God doing right now in your life? And let me ask, and I'm going to pray in a moment for God to open your spiritual eyes that you might see. But let me ask you this right now. What do you see? What about do you, when you die, do you see yourself in heaven? Do you see yourself in a relationship with Jesus? Maybe you're watching this morning and you just stumbled across this feed and you started watching and, or maybe somebody invited you uh, through Facebook or something for you to watch and you started watching because God's already been working on your heart. God's already been drawing you. But maybe you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe do, going through this whole you know, pandemic thing in our world has really opened your heart that you saw that, listen, you don't have control really over anything. We are dependent upon the God who is the God of the universe, and we need him. We can't even control tomorrow, let alone our destiny and our future. So this morning, if you're watching and you haven't given your life to Christ, if you were to die tonight, you're not sure you're going to go to heaven, or maybe at one time you've prayed that prayer, but you walked away from God, you're not serving God, you're, you're away from God, listen, this morning I'm going to ask you to open your heart to God. And let him come in. And listen, when you allow God to come into your life, everything changes. You're gonna, your vision is going to begin to change. What you see is going to begin to change. And the way you do that is not trying to do good works. The way you do that is you could never do enough good works to go to heaven by simply inviting Christ to come into your life. Listen, if that's you, I want you to just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. And I ask you right now to forgive me, come into my heart, and I make you my Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I renounce every spirit. I renounce my past. And I make you Lord over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you pray that prayer this morning, the Bible says right now your name is written in the book of life that angels are rejoicing. Actually, I was reading in my devotions this morning. Paul tells Timothy, he says, listen, those who confess him, the Lord will confess them. He says, those who deny him, the Lord will deny them. This morning, what you did was you confessed him. And as you begin to tell people what you've done, listen, the Bible says the Lord is confessing you before his father. He says, I know that guy. I know that lady because they confess my name. And uh, if you pray that prayer this morning, if you're watching on our online campus, there's a button on there that says, I raised my hand. If you just click that, fill out that information, we just want to know the prayer that you prayed. We want to pray for you. We want to encourage you. If you're watching on Facebook and you pray that prayer, uh, just send us an email. You can send us an email. Uh, you can send an email to info at harvestonline.church info at harvestonline.church. Just send us a quick email. Just tell us that you pray that prayer because, listen, we rejoice when we know that you did that. And we want to pray for you. We want to encourage you. And we're just so glad for what God is doing in your life. Now, listen, all of you right now, I want to pray for you that God opens your eyes. Actually, I'm going to surprise my wife. Have her grab a mic. She's here, and we are not social distancing at all. And I'm going to ask her to come up. And I want her to kind of help, uh, help lead right now to pray that your spiritual eyes will open. Amen. 
Amen. That's just actually one of the points of impartation that the Lord has given to me because, you know, just um, the way that he speaks to me is just really through vision and being able to see and those kind of things. So I want you to believe that something supernatural is actually going to happen to you, that there is going to be a transaction, uh, that the Holy Spirit is going to wake up your spiritual eyes and you're going to see past what you know now. You're going to see way into the future, far off into the future. So, Holy Spirit, I just invite you to come and and begin to to open the eyes of every person that is on this uh, online uh, streaming right now, has joined us this morning for our online church yes. together, has gathered for this. And I just pray that you open their spiritual eyes, that you wake up their eyes, that darkness and blindness would leave them right now, that, Lord, they would yes, see and catch these glimpses of what ahead and begin to see into the future and see afar off and even see into the coming generations and what you are saying today for the generations tomorrow. Lord, let it be an encounter. Let it be uh, just just a time of of intimacy with you, being able to see what you see and see afar off and see the future and hope that you have for each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Listen, we're praying, let hope arise in your heart right now. See, because when hope arises, you know, Scripture says, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let me tell you this. When hope arises in your heart, the enemies of your life become scattered.